everybody. Hey, everyone. How's it going? <laughs> We're so glad you're here. Thanks for coming. Yay. <laughs> um, Welcome to Wayfinding. Yeah. This is our third event in this series. And we, you know, every single one of them has been just incredibly uplifting and powerful and reminded us how important it is to hear poetry read out loud and how, you know, deeply that connects us with the writer and their intention. And we, we've been looking forward to this so much. So we're so glad you're here. And we're so glad that Ranger Cynthia Dormany is here as well from Texas Hill Country. Um, Thank you all so much. So we wanted to just get started briefly by telling you a little bit about Parks and Points. Sure, yeah. So Parks and Points started in 2016. Um, it started between Amy Beth and myself as a project between us that we could share some of our, our writing and uh, travel tips and budget tips. We realized that we both had a really interesting and shared, land, uh, shared love of national parks uh, and public lands. And so we started public Parks and Points um, as a way to actually share our writing and other travel tips for national parks, state parks, and local parks. But then we also uh, found that it was a great place to also share other people's creative works about these places and lands. Uh, and that's what happened. Yeah, we sort of realized after we started publishing travel itineraries and um, you know strategies that we wanted to share some more reflective writing about the parks. And we launched an annual essay contest and a um, shortly after that, a poetry series, which um, the first year that we put out a call for poetry submissions, we received 300 submissions. And, um, and we have received close to that number every year since. And so number one, that told us that there was really a lot of space to share this work and, and a real audience and um, um, sort of body of work to be shared. And then it also made it very hard, you know, to curate the series because we read so many incredible poems every year. So, um, you know, that continues to be a challenge, but we, we realized this is our fifth year that we had a body of work that could become a book. And um, as I was telling the poets earlier this evening, we really appreciate their encouragement because the second we put this out there as an idea. We received so much encouragement um, and we decided to create a few short essays for the book ourselves and to fill it with original parks photography. Um, you know, it's a beautiful color color edition that um, reads like a trail. So you begin at a trailhead and you meander through different topographies and landscapes uh, with short essays by us to contextualize the parks and their landscapes, um, woods and wilderness, snow, ice and canyons, wetlands um, and deserts, you know, deserts and mountains. So we, we we really hope that the book reads like a journey mm -hmm. and we're really excited to have a group of wayfinding poets tonight to bring some of that to life for you yeah and the book is actually uh being published through uh finishing line press and we're really excited about that uh, throughout the five years of parks and points and poetry we actually found that so many of the poets had published through finishing line and had a really great experience. So we are thrilled to say that the book is currently uh, going to be published this summer. Right now we're in our pre-sale period. You can order it now. And it's a great time to order the book. Uh, we do appreciate <laughs> that. I'm going to drop the link in the chat. Uh, that'll take you right <laughs> to the Finishing Line Press uh, website where you can place a copy. And again, it'll be shipping this summer. Yeah. So we're super excited to get started with a quick tour of LBJ's Texas White House in the Hill Country and Waco Mammoth National Monument. And Derek, had a couple of housekeeping. Just a couple of housekeeping. Yeah, we're kind of running in meeting mode. We are recording. And if you want to use the chat to uh, ask questions or give support to people, feel free to do that. It is open for public chatting. Um, <laughs> you can also uh, applaud as much as well. All right. Thank you so much. And now I think without further ado, we'll be going over to uh, Ranger, Ranger Cynthia. Cynthia. All right, Ranger Cynthia, take it away. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so can you hear me just fine? Great, okay. So first off, I'd like to thank Amy for inviting me to do this. I think this would be really enjoyable. And uh, I'm looking forward to giving you a tour of the, the park, Art Lyndon B. Johnson National Historic, Historical Park and Waco Mammoth National Monument. There we go. All right. So, of course, um, Lyndon B. Johnson National Historical Park is named for our 36th president, Lyndon Baines Johnson. And as president, of course, we're used to seeing um, our presidents 
in a dressed in this sort of fashion in a suit. But you know, when President Johnson didn't have to be in Washington, the one place that he always wanted to be was the Texas Hill Country. This was home. Um, it's where he was born and grew up. You know, every opportunity he had, he came here, you know, during the White House years. Um, in fact, he spent 25% of his time as president in the Texas home country at the LBJ Ranch. And naturally, Mrs. Johnson came with him as well. Um, you know, they loved it. And, um, you know, that having come from the Texas Hill Country and growing up as he did here, uh, the influences really had an impact on what he eventually would do as president. Now, our park is a little different and sometimes it can be a little confusing to visitors. I mean, the nice thing about having this virtual tour is that we can jump around a little bit <laughs> very easily um, because our park is actually in two what we call districts. There's the Johnson City District and then there's the LBJ Ranch and they're separated by 14 miles. Plus we have our sister park, the LBJ State Park. So um, for purposes, for, for our virtual tour, we're gonna start at the ranch and then we'll be heading into Johnson City and then going back out to the ranch. And I felt like, you know, when you start a story about a person, a place, of course, the best place to start is the beginning. <laughs> uh, you know, cue the, the oohs and ahs. Uh, you know, this is a picture of President Johnson, just a few months old. Uh, he was born August 27th, 1908, in a little house. Um, this is, again, this is the birthplace. This is out on the LBJ Ranch, you know, a small house. Um, his parents, Sam and Rebecca Johnson, were farming out here. Um, the house had originally been built by his, his, President Johnson's grandparents in 1889. Those are his grandparents there in the in the center, Sam and Eliza Johnson, along with Eliza's mother and several of Sam and Eliza's nine children. And eventually, when Sam Johnson Jr. married Rebecca, they moved into that house and uh, President Johnson's grandparents moved into a, another home just down the, the way. Um, but they got married in 1907, and just a year later, in 1908, their first child, Lyndon Baines Johnson, was born. Uh, but President Johnson's parents had a huge impact on him. President Johnson's father served in the state legislature for what would eventually be a total of 12 years. So President Johnson grew up going campaigning with his dad and, and uh, you know, hearing all about the, the politics and the issues that his dad was dealing with. I mean, really, if you, if you start to study about what Sam Johnson did here in the state, Texas state legislature, you can see so many, so many parallels with what his son, Lyndon, would later go on to do. Um, things like education bills, conservation bills. Sam, in fact, helped sponsor the bill that protected the Alamo. Um, civil rights related bills. And so, again, you know, so many of those things you can see reflected in what Lyndon Johnson would go on to do in his political career. So he learned the political facts of life from his dad. Um, his mother, Rebecca, let's see if I can go back, was one of the few college-educated women in this area. Very unusual. Even Sam just had a ninth grade education because he hadn't had the chance to go to college. And so Rebecca 
you know, took it upon herself to, you know, make sure her son was educated from an early age. She taught him his ABCs um, early on. And that would obviously have a huge impact on any child. Well, in addition to that, as Lyndon Johnson grew up, you know, they weren't very far from the little one room junction schoolhouse just down the way by a quarter mile. And uh, a four year old Lyndon Johnson would start, you know, hear the kids out here playing at recess. And of course they were having great fun. And he was a, he was a pretty active little kid. <laughs> and so he started wandering down to the school, you know, at a, that very early age, which worried his mom a little bit. They lived right along the river, you know, um, and so that well, obviously gave her some concern. And so she, in fact, asked the teacher, Katie Diedrich, to go ahead and enroll him in school at the age of four. Um, and she already had quite a challenge. This is the, this is the inside of the, the Junction School. She taught eight grades one time you know, about 40 kids. Um, Lyndon Johnson actually sat on her lap to do his lessons. But again, you know, that had such a huge impact on him. In fact, such an impact that years later in 1965, one of the bills that Lyndon Johnson would sign would be the Elementary and, education, Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And he chose to do it here at the Junction Schoolhouse, you know, the, you know, his first school. And he had Miss Katie, who was living in California at the time, flown in so she could sit there at his side um, as he signed that important bill, which gave funding for uh, you know, libraries and, uh, and school lunch programs and Title I programs. Just, an incredible piece of legislation that all again started, you know, uh, based right here on this property that's part of the LBJ Ranch. Well, by the time he was five, his parents decided that farming wasn't doing enough for a growing family. And so they decided to move into Johnson City. So this is where we're going to jump to the other district. And his folks bought a, a home in an entire city block, about two acres. Happened to be one of the nicer homes in town. Uh, eventually, they, they added a car. This is actually 1915. This is the Johnsons out, out in front. Lyndon is standing next to the car uh, with the family inside. Um, even though this was a very nice home and they had the advantage, some advantages, you can tell there's a dirt road here. <laughs> um, Johnson City was still very rustic. Okay, no electricity, no indoor plumbing. Um, you know, dirt roads, dirt yards. But his folks raised five kids here in that, in that three bedroom home. About 1,600 1, square feet, if you count the porches. Um, this is Lyndon um, at the age of 13, his first suit. And if you go left to right, you've got, uh, let's see, you've got oh, Lucia, Josepha, Rebecca, Lyndon, and Sam Houston. To give you an idea of what Johnson City looked like in those days, again, very rustic, very rural. Um, and that, again, had a huge impact on Lyndon Johnson. Um, the first bill, in fact, he ever um, helped get passed was while he was a congressman. Um, he was elected to Congress in 30, 1937. And two years later, in 1939, he helped bring electricity to the hill country, which made a obviously a huge difference for the folks living out here. 
Um, and really throughout his political career, you could see this same type of thread running through. He wanted to be able to help folks that give them the opportunities that they didn't have before. All right. While we're in Johnson City, we're going to make take a moment just to talk a little bit about his grandparents again. This is Sam Johnson Sr. and his wife, Eliza. Before there was a Johnson City, they actually lived in a dog trot cabin um, on eventually about a thousand acres. And Sam actually herded Longhorn cattle at the Chisholm Trail. So again, these are all things that you can see if you come to the park. Um, President Johnson as a kid would grow up hearing all these great cowboy stories and he loved it. You know, he, he's often been called the frontier president because of this. He's one of the last presidents to have that connection. Um, the other thing as a kid he often would do, well the whole family would do, is they would go visit his dad's sister and her family in their big house on the Perdinalis River. So we're gonna jump back to the ranch now. Now this is taken in the 50s. And you know, when President Johnson was a kid, uh, his aunt and uncle Martin had a big house. Uh, the Johnsons always had their big family get togethers there at, in the Martin home. And Lyndon Johnson loved the ranch. He'd spend summers with his aunt and uncle. And eventually his aunt uh, was not able to upkeep, you know, take care of a big house and about 250 acres. So they worked a nice deal. The Johnsons took over her house in the acreage and his aunt Martin moved into the boyhood home, the house that he had grown up in Johnson City. And uh, the house did need a little bit of work. You could see this, this is about 1952. That's Mrs. Johnson outstanding near the tree. Um, over time, as their needs grew, you know, so did the house. Um, he was a senator when they bought it. Um, they did the they said the work on the house, they put in a the sidewalk out front. President Johnson christened it, the LBJ Ranch at that point. You can see where he dated the sidewalk there. And again, it just grew and grew. You can see that center of the house is the Martin Helm. And then they added on the east and the west sides and out the back. Eventually, the house would grow to be about 8,400 square feet. Um, eight bedrooms, nine bathrooms. You know, they always had lots of guests there. Added a pool in the 50s. They added a, a runway, an airstrip, and a taxiway in the 50s which made it much easier for, for commuting. Plus when you have the river right here, um, you know, we're, we do have periodic flooding. So they always had a way to get off the ranch. Um, the airstrip is still there. The taxiway we actually use as a parking lot now to, uh, so folks, when you come to the ranch, you can park on the taxiway and then get out and see all the sites there at the house. I'm adding a, an airplane hangar, which now serves as our visitor center there at the Texas White House complex. Plus, we have one of the jets that re, was used during his vice presidential and presidential years. Um, but it's a, it is a beautiful home. The Johnsons loved it. Again, President Johnson spent 25% of his presidency there. You know, they had press conferences at the ranch. 
He had meetings there in that front yard in the lawn chairs. Um, so a lot of those important issues that he had to deal with during those years as president from 63 to 69, you know, all took place here at the ranch. When he'd have guests, he loved driving them through the pastures with the Herefords, those Lincoln Continental convertibles. Uh, the Johnsons also owned some property. Um, up on what is now Lake LBJ. And so he'd take him out for a drive in his Amphicar. Those are just two of the, the cars that you can also see today at the ranch as well. Um, but like I said, they loved it. Mrs. Johnson came to call it our heart's home. And uh, eventually when he'd leave office in 1969, well, clearly, this is where they decided to retire. Uh, unfortunately for President Johnson, it was a short retirement. And uh, in January of 1972, or 73, um, he passed away there at home on the LBJ Ranch, um, just where he wanted to be when that eventually happened. And uh, he was buried in the family cemetery, which is literally just across the road from where he was born, the birthplace uh, that we started out with. Um, eventually, Mrs. Johnson would be laid to rest next to him in, in 2007. So right there in the family cemetery, along with uh, Johnson, uh, brother and sisters, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles. Um, now, one thing the Johnsons wanted to ensure <laughs> was that even after they were gone, folks could come and enjoy the ranch and get a little bit of a feel for what it was like when they were living there. Um, so, um, initially, the Johnsons actually gave the birthplace to the National Park Service in 1969. Um, the boy at home came at the same time from uh, the town of Johnson City, who was uh, taking care of it at that point. And in December 1972, the Johnsons went ahead and deeded 600 acres of the ranch, along with all those buildings that I just showed you, all the main buildings at the ranch. And President Johnson always wanted this to remain a working ranch. So we still have the Herefords. Uh, we run as a historic working ranch. So all of our Herefords maintain that 1960s look to them. You can see we still do practice horn branding. We put an LBJ on one horn and a number for that animal on the other horn. Um, but uh, it's a place where you can come, you can take a driving tour of the ranch, see all those things that I just showed you. And, uh, you know, it's a, the hill country is a beautiful place. This is the, the Johnson settlement with the, the uh, longhorns that we have there. Yeah, let's see. I don't know how long I've gone. I'm probably coming pretty close. This Waco Mammoth is, uh, is a much smaller park than LBJ. Um, we're just going to take a, a couple minutes here. Um, but uh, Waco Mammoth, actually, we manage um, that under our umbrella. Um, So Waco Mammoth, actually, uh, the first discovery there of, a, of mammoth fossils dates back to 1978. Um, a couple of gentlemen were out hunting arrowheads, and they happened to see a huge giant bone in a riverbank. And fortunately for us, they were smart enough to take that to Baylor University. And uh, 
as they say, the rest is history. They went back, Baylor um, did some, some checking around and eventually what we would find there, what they would find would be up at this point in time, 24 mammoths along with um, a camel, part of a tooth from a saber tooth cat. These are all ice age animals. Um, we're talking about dated back to about 65,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago. But what in particular is very significant about this site, it's actually the, the only site in the United States that we have found what is referred to as a nursery herd, meaning mamas and babies. And uh, we believe it's at this point what it's, it's felt like because there's such a concentration here, the thought is because the river near is nearby, flash flooding is an issue here in the in Texas, that in, in all these instances, these animals had gotten trapped and couldn't escape. But today they're protected. Uh, that same site now has a shelter over it to protect it from the elements. You can go inside, we have an elevated walkway. So you can walk over the dig site. Some of the, some of the fossils um, were taken to Baylor at the Mayburn uh, Museum, but there's still a great many that are what we call in situ, meaning they're still in the exact place where they were found. Um, these are Colombian mammoths. Everybody's probably more familiar with woolly mammoths, you know, the cute fuzzy ones. Uh, woolly mammoths, their height's about 10 feet high. These are Colombian mammoths. So you can see we have a life-size painting on the wall there. They're much bigger. Everything in Texas is bigger. <laughs> Colombian mammoths are 14 feet tall. So it, this gives you an idea with the painting and the people there, um, just how huge they are. But uh, it's, a, it's a great place. Again, um, we'd love to have you come visit. I've got our... Uh, park information here. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. <laughs> and I'm going to do a little plug here because I happen to be the uh, our parks website person and kind of our graphics person. Now, <laughs> the National Park Service even has an app. All 423 parks are in here. So you can go to each one and, and learn all about it. And it's a great tool to have when you come to visit. So with that, um, that's gonna wrap it up for me. Excellent. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Thank you. Um, you know, it's I had toured LBJ uh, at National Struggle Park with Cynthia and invited her <laughs> to join us because it was such an amazing tour and really just fascinating to see how um, LBJ's childhood values shaped so much of his values later in his life. Um, I, I we had one great question in the chat here <laughs> that I think a few people had, which was oh, okay. how, about the cattle. What does what does a '60s cat, cattle look like? What is the branding for? <laughs> Okay, it might be hard, it, it would be easier. It's too bad I don't have a picture of one of our Herefords next to a modern Hereford. Um, let's see if I can back it up a little bit. So Herefords in the 60s tended to be a little shorter and stockier. Um, ours, our bulls will weigh about 1800 pounds. Um, it's not unusual for a Hereford today to be 22, 2,500 pounds, huge and massive. And then you notice all of ours have horns. Um, so we have horned Herefords. Today, 
people typically like what we what they call polled herefords meaning that the horns have either been removed when they're calves um, or they've been bred so that they don't have the horns so again you know with us it, it does present a little more work since we do the uh, the horn branding plus we actually have weights that we'll put on the end of the horns to turn them down so you get that nice curve there. Um, back in the 60s, they thought that that nice framing uh, was very aesthetically pleasing when you took them to shows. Plus, it's a whole lot safer if you don't have horns <laughs> poking out at you when you're working with them. So those are those are kind of the, the big differences there. That's great. Thank oh, you fantastic. for explaining. Yeah, <laughs> no idea. <laughs> uh, any other questions for Ranger Cynthia? You can pop a, we could take maybe one or two more in the chat. Uh, maybe one more. If anything, anyone has a burning question about the ranch or Waco Mammoth. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. That was a really wonderful was awesome. um, tour. And we're so glad you were able to be with us tonight. Yeah. Thanks, Great. Ranger. Thanks again for inviting me. Yeah. Yeah, it's so cool. I mean, it's definitely a place to go visit too in person now that I'm really excited. Yeah. yeah it looks like there's so much more to see there too. The cycling loop looks incredible too. Yeah, I know. Oh, well, thank so, you again. And everyone download that app. Get on there. <laughs> get out there and get that up for the summer. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll plug that too. <laughs> okay, so um, now we're going to start wayfinding. And as I mentioned before, the book is organized as a trail, and we do have a trailhead. And the poet who whose poet whose poem is placed at the trailhead is actually with us tonight, which is great. Which is Sarah Eddy. So um, we're going to turn the spotlight over to Sarah Eddy for Yosemite. I think you might be on mute. It's only been a year. I've just figured out muting. <laughs> um, uh, so I am Sarah Eddy. Yes, I'm speaking to you from Massachusetts, but my poem takes place in California. Um, I am most recently the, uh, the author of Full Mouth, which is a book of poetry about food um, and just because I can, I'll drop the link for that poem, that book into the chat. And um, it's actually from Finishing Line Press, which is the same press that um, that our anthology will come out from. So it's a wonderful press. They, they do great work and produce beautiful books. Um, so you can read my food poems if you want to. Uh, but this poem that I'm about to read is, um, it's, it's set from a time when I was 21, I'm now in my 50s, um, but, it, but it's about a time in my 20s when, um, I think everybody probably has this experience that in your early 20s, you have moments and uh, experiences that stick with you for your entire life. And for me, uh, right after college, I moved to Seattle with some friends and had a miserable time and, <laughs> Uh, then left feeling like I was uh, fleeing from Hades or something and traveled to California and then went to Yosemite with, um, with two very, very dear friends. Um, and so, and my experience going to Yosemite was, um, it was healing. It was a healing moment for me in my entire life. And I will never forget the experience I had there of crawling into a uh, redwood tree that had fallen on its side and had um, rotted from the inside. And I just crawled right into the middle of it. I, I feel like I can still smell it, to be honest. Uh, so the name of this poem is Yosemite, which is a little on the nose maybe, but, <laughs> um, but there you have it. It's called Yosemite. I left behind a sad story friendships ruined, love affairs sundered, a stupid job, and a new friend made but left behind on the last day in Seattle. I took the bus south, the green tortoise bus, 
with seats removed and one big mattress where latter-day hippies played guitar. I took it south to Joni's, California. And there from San Francisco, I went east to Yosemite. And I felt undone and ancient until I crawled into the belly of a fallen sequoia, felt the soft, quiet, earthly dust beneath my hands and knees and began the rest of my life. Thank you. Beautiful, thank you. And now from Yosemite to Lake Michigan with Anne DeVilbis. I hope I'm saying your last name right. <laughs> yeah, perfect, <laughs> Anne DeVilbis, um, that's my name. Um, I'm speaking to you guys from Louisville, Kentucky. Um, and thank you for putting this together. Um, it's great to be here with y'all tonight. Um, so my husband's family for decades has been going up to a little town in Michigan called Onekama every summer. Um, and there's a small lake that's by the big lake. Um, and so on Portage Lake, at the camp they go to, it's called Little Eden. Um, they do a lot of fishing. And then on the big lake, we kind of do a lot of walking around and swimming. Um, and it's just beautiful there. Um, so I wrote this poem in the big lake, lake thinking about the fish and kind of like what it means, like what types of survival we count on from other life um, and what that kind of means. Um, so what the fish know. The morning lake is a calm blue nothing, soft horizon reaching, early light cutting through small waves like a net scrimmed over the shallow places. Our feet move, pale clumsy giants, and even the hungriest fish skirt away, shy back to the murky gloam among the green reeds, wait for better quarry. As if they remember, how we take them inside our cheeks like sins or secrets, as if they remember how fish drown in air. First blood beats up along the edges of the gills, the neck flecked pink with blood's reaching, then white with the foam that gathers along the heaving sides. Their scales are sharp as teeth when we weigh them in our hands. You. Um, des we're going hiking in the desert now with Carol Deering. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for this series. <laughs> it's incredible. Um, I'm going to read a little introduction. I can't remember it all. So. Um, Okay. Um, I was in my early 20s also. <laughs> I was new to Arizona and it was my first hike down the Grand Canyon on the Kaibab Bright Angel Trail. My new hiking boots were bothering me. So I tried, I wanted to stop and take a picture to slow my boyfriend down. But as I whipped out my Instamatic camera out of my pocket, um, I heard a click. And so the first photo I took of the Grand Canyon was the last frame on my film, and it was of the inside of my pocket. So um, that, that's left out of this poem, but I wrote this poem tonight, um, remembering that first hike and uh, but I instead of focusing on the camera, I focused on the water and the stone and the stillness that it brought me. So my poem is called A Stillness Rose. First hike down, a stumble, new boots in bluish light. I stand up dizzy, staring past rippled stone to water, rippling water to stone, the setting sun angling prismatic. Full moon switchbacks, purple shadow walls, the light changes, 
and I start over differently. I need the turns, the time, the roar of the blazing river imprinted on my mind. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we're heading to Mount Tam with Kathleen Meadows. Good evening, I'm Kathleen Meadows, and I'd like to uh, thank Ranger Cynthia for her excellent virtual tour of the LBJ National Historical Park and Waco Mammoth, and of course, Amy Beth and Derek for all they've done in putting this wayfinding spring poetry series together and, and actually bringing all the national parks throughout the country into the spotlight, it's very important. So I'm from California. I live in the hills overlooking the San Francisco Bay. And the backyard of my home is actually a small grove of redwood trees adjacent to a natural park space. And in the evening, when I look out over the bay from my deck, I see the light changing over Mount Tamalpais. Uh, Mount Tamalpais is an ancient home of the native Miwok peoples of Marin. Uh, its name uh, roughly translated means bay or coastal mountain. And um, it's sometimes referred to as the sleeping lady. According to Miwok uh, legend, she was abandoned. So she walked to the top of the mountain and she died there of a broken heart. And the mountain was so moved that it changed its form, taking on the supine shape of her body. The light from this mountain inspired my poem. So here it is, the changing light. Last night, I saw the changing light, pink luster like the inside of a conch shell hauled from the beach, collecting time. It shell crystals primordial dust, perhaps the last gasp of a dying galaxy small pinpricks of ancient light cascading through my pupils, flowing like water carving the hillsides behind Mount Tam. I stood and watched the clouds of Marin moving methodically over the hills. Like a medieval scholar scouring the heavens, I could see across the bay, find my rooftop, touch the tips of my tallest redwood trees, spot my cat, playing with a fallen baby squirrel. I saw the light change to deep crimson at the horizon, soft purple bands melting silhouettes, sharpening my gaze on the fog blanketed headlands, lights from the red bridge haloed across Sausalito, motioning me back to the last waning light above, the first stars stitched onto blue black tapestry like primitive beacons signaling me home. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now to Eastern Neck with Kevin Oberlin. Hi everyone, I'm Kevin Oberlin. Um, thank you, Derek and Amy Beth. Um, I'm so grateful to the work you all have done and uh, to all of you who are joining us this evening. Um, this poem uh, was uh, written uh, during a, a short period when I was living in Maryland uh, for going to graduate school um, in kind of the Metro DC area. So uh, I was mentally in a very different place than I was used to in a lot of ways and spending a lot of time in kind of a academic mentality. And uh, my sister came out to visit uh, and uh, so in a way, this is a, a poem, uh, not just about a place, but a kind of a poem of, of gratefulness. Uh, and, and I dedicate it to my sister for um, getting me out of the apartment and saying, I've come all this way and there's this place I have to see and you have to come with me and see it too. Eastern Neck. Pant legs turned up, she wades out into the Chesapeake, the marsh quiet around the cold inlet like a dormant lung encased in vines and felled trees, remnants of winter. The water's pressure on her whitened ankles, less a pull than the soft suck of barnacles on driftwood and broken rocks. 
she submerges an amaretto bottle, a bulbous fish she fills with sand and shells, the round stones she has gathered, a still life captured in glass, a costless substitute for a souvenir, the purple label's edges peeled back from the skin as she draws the bubble up, water skimming the dark hairs of her arms toward its free fall from her elbows. The gift is not in this sip of ocean, but how sunlight streams from her body like a wing as she looks toward the shore. Thank you. Thank you. And now to Coastal Maine with Marianne K. Shapiro. So where I grew up in the Bronx in New York, it was literally a crime to step on the grass. All the grass was uh, held back with big chain link fences. And if you stepped on the grass, you got what they called a ticket. And if you had three such tickets, it was three tickets and out, you were evicted. So my childhood had very little of nature in it that was not behind the chain link fence. And when I got out of there, when I escaped that background and came to Massachusetts, I was thrilled to see things like grass you could step on and flowers you could see. And then in the summer, we got to go to Maine. And so this poem is about the place we go in Maine uh, almost every summer uh, where we rent a cabin and it's called Lifespan. The curtain rises, summer, Maine, a screen door, Luna moth, soft glowing, pistachio wings trembling, soundless waiting, waiting, one week. Is today day one? And then what? So quiet now, the humans have blasted off, freedom exploding like champagne uncorked, rocketing to golf, tennis, biking, water skiing, hiking, swimming except for me sitting, keeping company with the occasional loon, the lone duck, the lake, mountain, sky, cabin a little ways uphill, one room for sleeping, eating, washing, writing, reading, family, after dinner parlor games, cards, telling when I was your age stories of our wild years to the kids, grandkids, who can't quite take it in. Really? No, really? They shake their middle-aged adolescent heads, preparing to Facebook their friends the moment they rejoin their iPhones at the nearby little rental houses. You and I wait quietly together. We turn almost as one to find the lunar moth flickering almost imperceptibly like a yardside candle in its final hour. <clears throat> we fall asleep, our dreams washed in gauzy green, weaving miracles of timeless time, where sky becomes ocean, where now becomes forever. She's gone, for where? The question is a nesting doll, in which each answer will reveal another mystery. It gets louder by the minute. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so now we are going to, I'm speaking louder. <laughs> we are going to have a prose reading, nice interlude from Yi Shen Lai, who um, a few years back, uh, won second place in our annual essay contest for an essay called Birthright and who has a wonderful new book out called Pinups. And um, I'm going to just share with you the context for Birthright and then I will let, uh, which was written by um, the contest judge Melissa Falavino at the time. And then I'll let Yishan tell you a little bit more. The intro is written by. 
um, birthright is an examination of citizenship, belonging, and home set against the backdrop of Manzanar, a National Park Service site of conscience that during World War II was a Japanese-American internment camp in Owens Valley. The narrator exists between two homes and cultures, the desert of California and her native Taiwan, and wrestles with the privilege of citizenry, access to public spaces, and what it means to be American. And we're so grateful to, Li to Yishan for joining us tonight and for asking questions and introspecting in her writing that we're always so glad to share. Thank you so much for having me, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm so pleased that we got to hear that introduction. I don't remember that from Melissa, so it was really nice to hear it. Um, the question of citizenship is always very interesting to me. I think as an immigrant, I tend to experience um, our national spaces a little bit differently. Um, so it was really nice to be able to have this opportunity. Uh, Pin Ups, which is a very small book, it's a micro memoir, um, is about my long ragged relationship with outdoor sport and what that's taught me about living in these United States. So without further ado, here is part of Birthright. Have I told you how much I love the desert? I love it for its hardy plants, for its scrappy animal life, for its sweeping vistas and all of its extremes. I love it for its weirdness and maybe for its utter contrast to Taiwan, the humid foliage covered land I also call home. I love the desert so much that we got married there in California's Death Valley National Park. On a recent return visit, my husband and I drove past the road to Death Valley to visit Manzanar National Historic Site. It's a National Park Service site of conscience now, but during World War II it was an internment camp for Japanese Americans. I say Japanese Americans, but the thing we must never forget is that these were Japanese American citizens. Some were born here, some were born in Japan, and they made America their home. Any which way you slice it, they belonged. Many Japanese Americans couldn't even identify with the nation that had bombed Pearl Harbor, and many of them volunteered for military service. There were several Nisei-only units in the US Army. About 14,000 men served in the 442nd Infantry Regiment, and it earned 9,486 Purple Hearts. Its motto was distinctly American, go for broke. These Japanese American men volunteered while their families were interned at Manzanar. We have visited twice now, once at the tail end of winter and once at the beginning of summer. It's a distinctly uncomfortable place no matter the season. If you love the desert like me, you can kind of see the appeal of Manzanar's setting. The Sierra Nevadas hitch a jagged line into the sky, taking on different colors and textures with each season and hour of the day. And the constant wind creates the impression that the place is breathing. The scrub and low bushes contrast a nearly treeless landscape. And Manzanar had been a working apple orchard. It wasn't entirely bereft of civilization. But if you had been taken from your home near the sea or away from a town and a life you knew and loved, ah, never mind. if you'd been forced from any life you called your own, you could see how the mountains might look like walls, how wind only serves to work the sand and dust in everywhere, how scrub and low bushes only remind you of the lush places like Seattle, San Diego, and Hawaii that you chose when you immigrated to this land, when you brought your family here, where you thought you had made a life of yourself, where the opportunities and the choices had seemed endless. You can see, right, how work at the apple orchard and later the work opportunities at the soy sauce and miso, miso factories might start to work like forced labor. Never mind the watchtowers all over the place. Never mind the barbed wire. Never mind those. A lot of work went into the, man, into the resurrection of Manzar as a national park's historic site in 1992. A massive community hall houses exhibits on what life was like in Manzanar, school dances, a baseball league, crafting furniture from apple crates. A short walk from the community hall are reconstructions of the barracks folks first saw upon arrival. The barracks had been hastily constructed so the planked walls weren't exactly airtight. Even later, nothing would be dustproof. Folks who lived here wrote about how hard it was to keep clean. As much as I marvel over it, desert sand is insidious. Driving around Manzar, there are interpretive signs, the orchard, the hospital, the cemetery. Thank goodness for those, because after a little while, you start to lose the plot. You start to wonder how on earth we ever got here, to a place where it was okay to treat citizens of your country like their cattle, to a place where individual toilets aren't walled off and you do your business within knees width of another human being, to a place where you decide that folks who had come to this country of their own free will, who had worked hard to carve out a place of their own, could be punished for it. How did this happen? But then you get to the gardens. Merritt Park has a big pond, a bridge, a cement turtle, a waterfall. An artist who was interned at Manzanar once made a watercolor of the garden in full bloom, and to see its careful reproduction of the, dove, of the detailed bridges, rock sculptures, and varied plantings is to forget about the dust and the dirt, and for a split moment, the fact that we imprisoned our neighbors and our friends. The people here built gardens wherever they could, tiny ones outside each barrack, big ones you could walk with your sweetheart in, green walkways outside the hospital, 
To see them is to be reminded that the people who were imprisoned here and in nine other camps across the United States work to make this place a little better. To know of them is to witness how can we can imprint the worst with our own marks of beauty. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for, so much for reading. And uh, we do have an interview with Yishan also on our website about her new book, if you're curious to know more about her process and her uh, and that, that book. Um, that is on our homepage as well. So now we're going to join Marjorie Thompson. Thank you, Derek and Amy Bath and Ranger Cynthia. I think somebody, um, the last reading series said this was the best Zoom they've been to in a year. And I would have to agree with that. <laughs> that by far the most fun and creative and inspiring Zoom session. <laughs> so thanks again. Um, my first poem is called Discarding Sorrow at the Outer Banks, North Carolina. And it's about being in the Outer Banks. And at the time, uh, my niece was there and she was, she was a, still a teenager, but early teens and really struggling and um, going through um, coping with some trauma and just having a really hard time. And I was walking on the beach and I was just inundated with these beautiful images and all my senses were being moved. And it was just this profound experience. And I think we're, we're in nature. How do we share that? And I find that writing poetry is one way to connect nature with people who may not be aware of it, who, who are just maybe um, struggling in their lives and not being able to be in touch with it. And while she didn't read the poem right away, she has now read it and I, I hope that it has helped her. Um, and also I think when we write, um, whether about nature, or just any other experience, we're also in some ways writing to ourselves too. And I found that looking back at this poem. So this is called Scarting Sorrow at the Outer Banks, North Carolina, and it's for Clara. Begin with a flying line of pelicans in command of latitude above a house by the sea. See a fish skeleton, hand carved, thin and thick wooden bones above a door. Walk the soft shore among the jelliness of moon jellies, little moons of translucence, alien and fine. Did you hear moon jellies were once sent into space? And the wood carver of scales and fishtails finds beauty in flaw and blemish? Kudos to the dolphin who already knows how to be her own accomplishment. On a salty night, do an inventory of sweet. Let your body be like the ocean. Bathe, in, bathe its possessions, its breathing jewels. Tend the underwater flowers. And the next one is called the Conference of the Birds at Mount Shakorwa. And Mount Shakorwa is in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. And it's a place that's very dear to my mom. She would hike it um, every summer. I think she may even be watching now. Um, and this was, I had gone to Boston and there was a show, it was a dance music performance called The Conference of the Birds. And it's the masterpiece of Persian literature about the soul search for meaning by the poet Farid Uddin Attar. And I think just, hiking the White Mountains and having seen this um, beautiful dance show, there was this confluence of the two uh, art and nature. And, you know, now I don't even know, did I see it first and then did the hike or the hike and then watch the dance? Um, but I just love the beauty of that. And also the juxtaposition of, of art and then being out in the wilderness. So the Conference of the Birds at Mount Shakorwa. The birds are passing over. Perhaps I'm in the valley of wonderment where the wayfarer becomes perplexed, steeped in awe, finds she has never known or understood anything. It's true, 
This bald, hot rock face with bright baby pines springing up through cracks, pointy miracles, confound my gusto for climbing higher. Infinity of green, and I don't really understand my walled heart, its need for precision and joy, but once in a while, it halts and tinkers with sorrow. My eye and this light are where I'll begin again. The valley's cloud shadows, shape of lakes rocking with the wind. More awe, my son putting his cap atop mine. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And now to the south, Oh, and now to the Southwest with Debbie Fees. Hi, well, I'm here in Lee Summit, Missouri, but I wanted to thank Amy Beth and Derek for providing a wonderful platform for writers that are inspired by nature. This gives us a way to share with others. And Cynthia, your presentation was so fun. Uh, we were able to go to both sites before, and so it was wonderful for us to be able to uh, see it again through your eyes in the presentation that you had. The poem that I'm going to share tonight was inspired by a visit to Ghost Ranch in New Mexico. And Ghost Ranch is a retreat and an education center it's close to a village called Abacu, New Mexico, but not very far from Taos or Santa Fe, if you're familiar with those areas. It is surrounded by 21,000 acres. There's red and gray hills, yellow cliffs and mountains. Our daughter Danielle was the first one to go there and she described it as magical. So we knew we had to visit. But we're not the only ones who found Ghost Ranch to be inspiring. Georgia O'Keeffe first visited in 1934, and she fell in love with the landscape. She made her home there, a studio, and some of her most famous works are those of the landscape surrounding Ghost Ranch. When you go to Ghost Ranch, it's almost like you're stepping into one of her paintings and experiencing with her the land that she actually loved. My husband and I went to Ghost Ranch in the fall and the foliage was breathtaking. I was captivated by the colors and it was so hard to capture it. It was almost indescribable. In my poem, I share this struggle with you. Number 395, and a quote by Georgia O'Keeffe. Sometimes you can only say with color what you cannot express in words. My camera shutter clicks a fourth, then fifth photo. The lens attempts to capture Ghost Ranch, its burnt shades on folding mountains red brick mudstone, tan sandstone. But snapshots blur the lone cottonwood bent as if in its thirst in spring, wearing a crown of harvest moon. Autumn foliage hides its branches, golden red and tangerine yellow leaves blush in the setting sun. I pick up my journal write pasty phrases unequal to saturated hues of the tree. Then I remember O'Keefe, her color chart, over 500 colors, always with her as she paints. I note 395, 397, 398. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Our next reader is taking us camping, Martin Willits, Jr. Hello, how are you doing tonight? Thank you for this program. Thank you in your program. Um, I have been a stream 
camper in my life. When I was 20 years old and came back from Vietnam, I hitchhiked all the way from uh, San Francisco to Syracuse, New York. And along the way, all I had was a backpack. About tents, whatever I could carry in a backpack. And I, along the way, because I was hitchhiking, I was taken off route a lot. So I saw a lot of parks on my way back. And I've been, was extreme camping all the way up to I was 60 years old. So this is called camping. An ember in a smothered campfire stack crackled its last breath. A movement of stars hunches over the charcoal clouds. The world closed in like a tent. The sum total of my life, this infinity beyond stars where frightened lives and smallness exist. My heart is always restlessly disturbed. When in the landscape of dreams, that quiet presence respond to the world and all its fleeting assurances, we are strangers even to ourselves. We could burn and turn cold as coal. We could go into storm fields, trying to brush away long hanging branches like a person fighting sleep. And still, we could be seen within silence as snow reminds us firmly, it is time to hibernate. To the west, I knew a mountain by touch. The sky is graying, a freeze is coming, arriving late. Thank you. Thank you. To one of our most iconic uh, national parks, uh, the first national park, Yellowstone with Corey Wells. Uh, thank you so much, y'all. I really appreciate Amy and Derek and the opportunity to be involved in this project. Um, so by way of introducing this poem, I live in middle Tennessee in the exact center of the state where the land is very green and it's either flat or very gently rolling hills. And um, the most threat it may ever uh, exhibit is either limestone outcroppings, which are sometimes difficult to build on, um, or, or sinkholes, and that's about it. And so when my husband and I took our first trip out to Yellowstone just a few years ago, I was amazed at how different the landscape is out there. And so I think this poem really speaks for itself. It is also in my book, Sugar Fix from Terrapin Books. And um, I'll just add that it was really inspired by watching out the window from Old Faithful Inn that I was uh, an opportunity I was really glad to have. This is called On This Uncertain Earth. We walk expectantly among the geysers the land here like nothing we've known before. We might as well be on the moon or Mars. There's so much we can't name. Vague cues we don't recognize until the moment they spew hot secrets. Look how the minerals rise and shimmer. How the mud simmers in pastel swaths. How twilight lasts and lasts. Now, in our room at the open window, we lie and watch, just watch, the cool, thin air from which, like magic, bats appear, scores of them, to spin and spiral in the pine tops, because we all need to eat. And isn't dancing good for the soul? In this wilderness, we've come to understand perilous, and more than that, precarious, and more than that, possible. 
which is why we see now through the fogged gloaming beyond the bats and thick pines, massive buffalo grazing, and beyond them, a lone chipmunk skittering to its burrow. Soon it will be dark enough to see the Milky Way and a million stars winking down on this yellow bubbling earth, down on our warm forms, almost lost among the soft spots, biding their time, hungry for something we'd rather not name. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all for logging in, logging out, staying, uh, Sarah. Thank you for um, emceeing. <laughs> and we have one last poem for tonight, which is for, by Allison Whipple. All right. Hi, my name is Allison Whipple. Uh, I'm here in Austin, Texas. And my poem is set out in uh, Big Bend National Park, uh, specifically, well, um, mostly in the Santa Elena Canyon, but in some of the surrounding trail area as well. And I, uh, I wrote this in early 2016, uh, when the 2016 election was uh, really heating up. So uh, if you can think back to that and just remember some of the rhetoric uh, that was happening around there, especially um, in relation to the Texas-Mexico border, which, um, you know, it's complicated, but uh, a lot of politicians uh, seem to have a very skewed view and seem to have never been there. I'll just say that. Photograph of you straddling two countries. The Rio Grande is only shin deep, but the current almost pulls me to my knees as I try to take your picture. We're both wincing pebbles, stabbing the soles of our feet in the rushing water. You stand in your Walt Whitman hat, grin, ask, which side am I on? Beyond the frame, you'll step onto the Mexican riverbank. No fear of the border patrol helicopters that tore across the sky 10 minutes earlier. You stare at the sheer cliff of the Santa Elena Canyon rising from rocks behind your back. Say, any politician who thinks he can build a wall has never seen the border. Yesterday on the Boquillas Canyon Trail, we saw carved walking sticks, painted rocks, a handwritten price list in Spanish, a collection bowl, items for sale, but nobody to watch for theft, nobody to make change. An invisible artist slipping across boundaries, undeterred, the blades of the Airbus A star chopping through the desert. I wish I'd bought something, wish I'd let her know which side I was on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank all the poets. Can we just maybe unmute our mics and thank the poets with some applause and Ranger Cynthia for an amazing evening and so much beautiful work.